Welcome to the Personalized Medicine Podcast. This is the place where scientists, clinicians, and entrepreneurs discuss the progress of this rapidly developing field. I am your host, Alexander Yahensky. Let's start. Three, two, one, and we are live. Welcome to the episode 9 of the Personalized Medicine Podcast. In today's episode, we dive deep into the topic that could not be more relevant today, diagnostics of infectious diseases. And I am very excited to welcome on our show Tim Blaukamp, the co-founder and chief scientific officer of Carius, one of the most promising medical diagnostics companies in the world. Tim did his PhD in biochemistry at the University of Michigan, where he studied genes involved in nitrogen assimilation in bacteria. He then continued as a postdoc, first in Michigan and then at Stanford, researching the mechanisms behind wind signaling and its role in cell differentiation. He then joined Molecula Inc. as a head of molecular biology. Molecula was acquired by Illumina and Tim was responsible for bringing to life the technologies that made it possible to generate long and accurate sequencing reads. About six years ago, Tim co-founded Carius, a company that leverages genomics and AI for fast and precise diagnosis of infectious diseases. Tim and his team has achieved an enormous progress during the last years, bringing the diagnostic tests to clinics that are already changing the lives of patients. Tim, I know you're extremely busy, so thank you very much for finding time to talk to us. It is a great honor and privilege to welcome you on our podcast. Ah, Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, I'm very excited to actually talk about what we're doing and and how it's impacting the field of precision medicine. Perfect. So let's start with Carius. I know that just in February this year, you have closed a Series B financing round of stunning $165 million. It is a very big deal, especially for the companies that work in diagnostics. So I would like to ask you, how has it all started? How did you come up with the idea for this company? And what were the main milestones that brought you to the place you are at today? Yeah, it's been quite a journey so far. Um, If we start at the very beginning, actually, it all started with a discovery in Steve Quake's lab at Stanford, where we were actually studying some transplant rejection mechanisms based on cell-free DNA. And we noticed that these patients who were immunocompromised would often get infections. And as we were analyzing the cell-free DNA in their bloodstreams, we noticed that the pathogens that were causing their disease were leaving significant amounts of DNA from their genome as these free-floating DNA fragments in blood that we refer to as cell-free DNA. And if we were able to extract those DNA fragments from plasma, we could sequence them and actually get to a species level identification of pathogens causing these diseases at these um, otherwise localized infections throughout their body. So the value of this type of discovery, of course, is that most current diagnostics almost always require you to get a sample of the infected tissue or fluid that you either try to grow the microbe out of or that you use some sort of directed PCR test to um, identify a limited number of pathogens based on their PCR. Of course, having the DNA from all of these different bacteria and and fungus and and molds and parasites and DNA viruses accessible through the bloodstream opened up an entirely new possibility of identifying these infections um, based on sequencing that information. It was actually very similar to other work that Steve had done in his lab previously working in the non-invasive prenatal testing space and and in the space of detecting uh, transplanted organ rejection based on this DNA. And if if your listeners are familiar with uh, liquid biopsy for infectious disease uh, or liquid biopsy for cancer, um, you can think of this as liquid biopsy for infectious disease. I guess where we are today is we offer a diagnostic test out of our CLIA certified CAP accredited lab here in Redwood City. And we use the test to identify infections that are caused by any species of bacteria, fungus, mold, parasite, or DNA virus that's uh, causing disease really anywhere in your body 
in less than 24 hours, uh, again, based on the cell-free DNA that these pathogens shed into your blood. Now, the, I think you also asked about the milestones that got us here. Um, you know, this bit in between the, the research idea or the research discovery in, in an academic lab and the actual implementation of a clinical diagnostic test is, is the really interesting and the very, very hard parts. And so um, we could spend the whole podcast talking about that. But um, I'll just summarize it by saying that uh, I, the, the very first step is to, of course, um, find a team that you're very comfortable with. And so I teamed up with the same CEO that I worked with at Moleculo, uh, Mickey Curtis, to start the journey and then uh, we raised money and went through the the standard phases of taking a, a research idea through the that initial discovery through the optimization through all of the regulatory hurdles and and even into the scaling process that's required to to actually have a research idea turn into an impactful clinical technology perfect that sounds fantastic and it's really a long but very very interesting exciting journey so yeah. let's start uh on the scientific side first um, perhaps you can tell our audience what is actually an advantage of sequencing um, cell-free DNA uh, from potential pathogens from blood sample in comparison, for example, to standard um, culture microbiology methods. Yeah, for sure. So standard culture and, and microbiology methods, as I, as I said previously, they typically all require you to actually have in your hand a sample of the infected tissue or fluid. And while we're all very familiar with bloodstream infections, um, the vast number of infections occur elsewhere in your body, in your lungs, in your heart, in your various internal organs like livers and kidneys, and even in your brain. And for those infections, getting a sample of the infected tissue or the surrounding fluid that may contain some of the organisms is a, is a very invasive, expensive process. And once you actually do get it, of course, then most methods would require you to spend the time um, trying to grow more of that organism so you have enough of it to actually do your testing on. Enough of it to either see how it behaves under the microscope, see its morphology, enough of it to do the traditional staining methods that distinguish one species from another. And that growth, of course, takes time and and requires the, the conditions that enable the organism to grow in this entirely new environment outside your body when where it was growing is inside your body. And of course, many organisms aren't able to do that. And so a lot of those invasive procedures end up coming back negative simply because the, the organisms um, can't grow in this new environment. What sequencing allows you to do is if you do have that invasively obtained tissue or fluid, you can pretty readily obtain the nucleic acids, turn it into a, a sequencing library, and use the information uh, that you obtained from those organisms to identify which organisms are present in that sample without the need to actually grow it up. So you can refer to this as direct from sample testing. That's incredibly useful because you're no longer limited by the relatively small number of organisms that would actually be able to grow once you've removed them from the body. Now, of course, our technology goes one step further. We do use sequencing to identify the organisms, but by using the DNA that's shed into blood by these organisms, even when the organism itself isn't in the blood, we're able to avoid the need to even obtain that sample of infected tissue or fluid. And so what we're doing is we're combining the best of both worlds into one test where we avoid the need to get that infected sample or fluid. And we're using sequencing then to avoid the need to culture it in order to identify what pathogens are causing the disease. Perfect, that sounds great. You actually do not need to do that complicated and often painful biopsy to detect the pathogen. You can just do it from a blood draw from that liquid biopsy sample. Yeah. But that would mean that your method has to be extremely sensitive to capture that tiny amount of cell-free DNA. So how do you get to that high sensitivity? And perhaps what are the techniques that you apply on top of DNA sequencing to capture that weak signal from the blood? Yeah, um, you've hit on one of the, the most important technical challenges for using the cell-free DNA um, in addition to using the sequencing. When, we've, when we first made this discovery at Stanford, uh, it was based on very low amounts of nucleic acid sequences from the, 
from the pathogens causing these infections. Now, as it turns out, in the last five years that we've been optimizing this method, we've learned that the vast majority of microbial DNA in blood is not very efficiently captured by standard methods, including the ones that we were using at the time or, or any other methods that um, we see commercially available. So we developed our own methods to access the microbial DNA specifically that was in blood and our own methods to turn that into sequencing ready libraries. And what we found as we optimized these methods further and further and further is that we can find at least a hundred times more information from these microbes in blood than what we were aware of even existed at the time. And so while, while there is a lot of human DNA in blood as well, the raw material from those microbes causing disease throughout your body is incredibly abundant in blood. You just have to sort through a lot of human DNA to get to that material. But once you find it, there's more than enough there to make uh, very sensitive diagnoses of, of these diseases that are occurring throughout the body. So of course, I mentioned the human. The other big technical challenges, as long as we're on the, the technical challenges uh, for sample prep anyway, is, is this overwhelming amount of human. It's about a, a million molecules of human cell-free DNA for every one molecule of microbial DNA. And so as we were doing these optimizations, of course, we learned about some of the physical differences between microbial DNA and human DNA. And we exploit those differences to remove uh, more than 99% of the human from every sample we process. And that allows us to see more deeply into the microbial DNA than we would be able to without removing that human. In terms of that raw material, the other, the other thing to note is that we've done some comparisons of just how much cell-free DNA is in the blood for every one particle of a, of a bacteria or virus in this case that may be detectable by other methods, just to get some idea of what the potential for using cell-free DNA could be. Now, there's not a lot of quantitative tests for bacteria out there, but there are some very good quantitative tests for viral infections, such as EBV, BK, or, or CMV, for example. And so we've compared quite extensively on hundreds of samples the quantity of DNA that we see compared to these other tests. And we find that for in CMV, for example, we're seeing about 1,300 fragments of DNA for every one virion that's detectable through traditional PCR methods um, for this, this virion. And so that gives us um, an incredible advantage in terms of being able to count unique pieces of information in, in support of one hypothesis for, versus another. The trick is getting at that signal, but once you've accessed it, there is a, a lot of signal there to work with. Um, and, um, you know, as I said, a lot more unique pieces of information even than you know getting one piece of information from one particular site of a of a viral genome as you would with PCR. Yeah, that's that sounds amazing and uh, like the level of sensitivity you're talking about is is really astonishing. Yeah. And uh, just to imagine that we have so much cell-free DNA uh, both human and from uh, the microbes in our blood that's I think something that would sound very counterintuitive probably 10 or 15 years ago. Yeah. In fact, that was one of the main challenges um, as we were getting the company off the ground is, you know, when we're talking at conferences, people are wondering if there's even enough microbial cell-free DNA to make these diagnoses. And then, of course, they wonder as well whether or not DNA in the blood is a reliable surrogate of infection elsewhere. And so for the last few years, the bulk of our research efforts have gone into the clinical validity and clinical utility studies, just showing over and over and over in different types of diseases, whether it's endocarditis or sepsis or osteomyelitis or pneumonia, that the signal in blood very accurately recapitulates the diagnoses that are being made through other technologies, more traditional standard of, of care technologies. Perfect. Now I would like to switch to the second challenge that you likely have been facing, and that is data analysis. Obviously, you will sequence through a lot of cell-free DNA, but then you would need to annotate it to understand from which bacteria it is coming, or is it bacterial DNA in the first place? So how do you tackle this challenge at Carius? Yeah. Uh, the analytics challenges are um, as severe or as challenging as the molecular biology challenges, 
challenges for sure. And in part, that because that's because, of course, bacteria share substantial portions of their other genomes with related bacteria. Um, humans share substantial portions or similarity in their genomes with a lot of the eukaryotic uh, molds or funguses and even parasites. And so figuring out where each unique piece of DNA that we're observing actually came from is one of those challenges where we, we use uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning to get better at doing this every time we do the test. Of course, the similarities aren't the only challenge. There's other challenges, uh, particularly in the environment is full of fragments of DNA that did not originate in the plasma samples that we're testing. So we call this environmental contamination and essentially every reagent that touches the sample, every plastic surface that contacts the sample, they all contain traces of DNA, even though they're sterile. Um, most of these contain fragments of DNA and for whatever reason, it's a lot of the same microbes that can cause disease. Um, which are also the same microbes that live totally healthily and even beneficially within our body, they, they contribute DNA to, that did not originate in the plasma, and that can confound the results if you're not extremely careful and extremely vigilant about accounting for what came from the plasma and what may have been derived from your extraction reagents or your library prep reagents or the plastic surfaces of your pipettes or your 96 well plates, for example. And so we've developed a, a number of both um, biological methods to reduce that contamination, as well as, of course, relying heavily on our um, informatics to carefully monitor the level of contamination that's coming from each one of those sources and account for it in the analysis of data that's being derived from plasma samples. And then I haven't even hit, you know, the other place we use machine learning quite extensively is to improve the quality of the genomic references that we're defining as truth. And so, of course, you see a sequence in plasma, um, in your sequencing data, you're going to match that to a database of reference genomes. The challenge there is that these databases of reference genomes are full of mistakes and errors, including misannotations, mixing of different samples, frequently contaminated with um, portions of the human genome that are not very well assembled yet. And so you can be pretty dramatically misled uh, by simply the quality of the databases if you're not um, taking active measures to constantly survey the new information that's becoming available, screen out the information that's going to cause you to make some errors, and then essentially curating your own um, database of what you believe are high quality truth sets that you can compare your sample sequencing data sets to to understand even what the raw sequences are where the raw sequences are being derived from at a species level. So there's no question that, uh, you know, if we think about the technology investment, we're investing at least as much in the, the databases, the quality of our, um, of our uh, algorithms that figure out which microbes are contributing these sequences and controlling the background contamination of misleading sequences as we are in actually accessing the cell-free DNA to begin with. Yeah, you just said that you are essentially investing uh, almost as much into your, let's say, molecular biology as into your analytics. Mm -hmm. That's uh, also something that I think for, for many biologists, for many uh, people from biotech industry would be also kind of counterintuitive because usually kind of the software component of every venture is considered to be an easy one. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's no shortage of challenges as we take this new, uh, as we take this new approach to infectious disease through the various regulatory channels, we're even finding that a lot of the guidance on, on how you want to go about analytically and clinically validating this test, um, you know, the guidance isn't really surfacing some of the key challenges. And so, of course, when we did our validation, our performance characterization work, uh, which we published last year, we talked about a lot of the new methods that we think are required to really vet a new technology, including the emphasis on a lot of these challenges we've been talking about on the analytics side, on the background contamination side, simply because uh, the, the, the societies that are advising on how to do this type of work at high quality haven't had to face many of these challenges before. And so they're looking to the community to provide some guidance on what those challenges are and how to deal with them. Absolutely. Perhaps one more question regarding identification of those pathogens. 
it is probably not only important to identify genus or species of the pathogen, but also to sequence its entire genome, because then you can be more selective in antibiotic treatment that you can apply to fight a specific bacteria. Is it something that you also address at Carius? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, the, the species and the genus, even the identity of the pathogen itself, it has many uses, of course. The, the one we're talking about here is that it's a common language between diagnostic companies and physicians who need to choose an antibiotic to help treat that uh, specific pathogen. And so as we think about the different ways that we ultimately are trying to just use information to get to an antimicrobial treatment that will help a patient feel better, you know, of course, sometimes you don't have anything, so you just use the symptoms and decide on the best empiric treatment. Um, certainly imaging can help, and there are certain versions, particularly in pneumonia, of different images that will suggest what the pathogen is, and then you use your information about that pathogen to get to a particular treatment. But knowing the genus when it's possible, again, gives you more specificity. We provide all of our answers at the species level, simply because there are uh, one, there's enough information in blood to get to that level very reliably, and two, the difference in the most effective antimicrobials between species is often quite large. And then what you're asking about is, can we go even within a species to get to the strain level? And the answer there is yes, we can, of course. Um, it depends a lot on the coverage of each particular microbe, which is a function of the degree of the infection. So it's certainly easier when there's a high level of infection to see the, the whole entire genome at enough depth to understand whether there are specific markers uh, or mutations that would cause the, the pathogen to be resistant to what you might consider the first choice antibiotic, and that information is incredibly useful. We're also developing methods that will selectively allow us to do this at much greater depth, even when these are even lower infections. And so if we think about the technology evolution that our, that our test is undergoing, this is the next frontier where we're getting to um, high sensitivity to detect those mutations or those differences that would lead to a physician choosing a different antimicrobial over a standard one. But of course, sequencing offers uh, additional potential beyond just the antimicrobial choice for that one patient as well as we're seeing these days. Um, it can be very useful to know what's circulating in the community. And one of the most useful dimensions of using sequencing for a diagnosis is that not only will you see what's uh, the most abundant pathogens in a particular patient causing that disease, but you could see a lot of the other microbes that are circulating in the background as well and are either co-infections or subclinical infections that may not have yet emerged as the primary cause of whatever symptoms a patient is facing, and you could use that information to understand at the strain level even how microbes are moving through space and time um, once this becomes a widespread approach to infectious disease. Perfect. That sounds great. I have one very important question to ask you in these challenging days of coronavirus epidemic. Can we use Carrier's approach to detect viral DNA as well? So yes, we detect all DNA-based viruses. Uh, we're working very hard to bring RNA viruses online. Um, probably by the time that we get the ability to see the cell-free RNA, I would guess the majority of the coronavirus epidemic will have passed us, but certainly coronavirus is not the last epidemic uh, that the world will see. And I think we're becoming aware with SARS and MERS and now coronavirus that um, epidemics are, are probably just a point in time and everything will at some point become a pandemic and having the tools to see these evolving strains of viruses and bacteria um, that in a way that you really only can through sequencing is going to become i think an integral part of the tool uh, of the benefits that sequencing offers as, as one of these tools that are used for diagnostics great and perhaps one short follow-up question uh, what's the technical difference between sequencing, for example, DNA and RNA or DNA or RNA-based viruses? Uh, well, um, certainly in the approach we're taking, which is based on the signal found in plasma, the cell-free DNA, or in the, in the case of RNA, the cell-free RNA, the half-life uh, or the length of time which that molecule 
lives or exists in plasma before it's completely destroyed by the enzymes that are also in plasma it differs quite a bit between DNA. And so for DNA, it's about two hours based on our experiments, which is great because it's long enough to capture a, a lot of that signal from a pathogen. But it's also short enough such that if you effectively remove the source of an infection, the DNA in blood goes to essentially zero in less than a day, or certainly undetectable levels. So that's a little bit different for RNA. The RNA signal in blood, if it's not protected by being encased in something, is about two seconds. And so there's just a fundamentally lower amount of that RNA circulating as free RNA in blood. And in addition, a lot of those RNA viruses, the, when they cause localized infection, you might say, well, why don't we just test then for the, forget about cell-free, um, let's test for the virus itself. And a lot of those viruses don't uh, have high loads in blood as far as we can tell so far. And so they necessitate a need to go to the source of the infection. And that's why you're seeing almost all of the diagnostics right now addressing the coronavirus, for example, um, requiring that the, the diagnostic tests start with a sample uh, that's either a nasal swab or a bronchial alveolar lavage, or in some cases, a saliva sample, but something that's expected to be very near the source of the infection. Perfect. Got it. So it is this fundamental difference in the stability of DNA and RNA in environment of the blood and some biological properties of RNA viruses that make them harder to detect. Yeah, harder to detect, um, particularly non-invasively or, or less invasively from the blood. Got it. We are doing this show for you and your feedback is very important for us. So if you have any suggestions or comments, would like us to cover a specific topic or recommend a guest, please write us an email to team at pmedcast.com. Or you can reach out to us on LinkedIn, Twitter, or Facebook. Just type in Personalized Medicine Podcast and you will find us there. To download the show notes for this episode, visit our website, pmedcast.com. It's p-m-e-d-c-a-s-t dot com. The show notes include guest bios, links to their most notable work, and recommendations for additional reads on the topic of the episode. Make sure to check them out. And don't miss the next episode. Subscribe to our podcast on your favorite podcasting platform. Give us a rating and leave a comment. It will help us make this show better. And now, let's get back to the interview. Let's switch gears to what does the test you are developing mean for patients. Perhaps you could describe us a journey of a patient that goes through your testing. Yeah, okay. So there's an almost infinite number of different pre patient presentations, of course. And the fact that we, we talk about the value of our test as being able to detect any bacteria, uh, DNA virus, uh, fungus mold, et cetera, anywhere in the body doesn't mean that this should be the first test everybody gets as soon as they start sneezing or coughing. There is definitely a, a time and place for every type of technology, and that, that may change over time. But right now, where we're seeing the greatest utility of our test is in patients that present with some sort of localized infection that is either a pneumonia or a bone infection or a brain infection. We're testing almost exclusively hospitalized patients at this point. And so a typical patient will go to the hospital uh, with some symptoms. They will have a blood culture or other first-line tests performed as standard of care, um, even in cases where it's unlikely that the blood culture is going to turn positive, such as pneumonia, for example, where a very, very few, less than 10% less than in some cases, actually turn positive. It's just a, a, such a routine, ingrained process that it's performed anyway. One of the great advantages uh, of our test then is that that patient, if a blood culture comes back negative, will likely be scheduled for some sort of, uh, call it um, lung sampling, either a lung biopsy or a bronchioalveolar lavage. Now, we've done several studies of these patients where we take a blood draw at the time at which an invasive 
procedure is indicated by the standard of care. And we simply ask whether or not the carious test is able to see the cause of in the infection, is able to actually call out the pathogen um, from the analysis of blood plasma, um, either at a higher rate or before an invasive procedure um, is able to identify it. And what we see is that in study after study, we're able to identify between 80 to 90% of the pathogens that an invasive procedure would have identified. And we're able to do that simply from the analysis of the DNA that's in blood. And that would be, uh, that would be enough of a reason for most physicians to try a non-invasive test first, if that were it. But the fact of the matter is that in all of these studies, about half of the invasive procedures actually come back negative for these reasons we described earlier. And that's um, either the, the patient has been treated ahead of time with antibiotics, antibiotics that prevent the microbe from growing, or the, the microbe is simply one that doesn't grow very well or grows very slowly in culture once it's removed from the body. And in those cases where even the invasive procedure was negative, we're finding that we can identify the cause of the infection in almost half of those negative cases on top of all the ones that the invasive procedure was able to identify. And what that gives us is an overall um, significantly higher diagnostic yield from this non-invasive analysis of DNA and blood relative to the, even the invasive procedures that are now standard of care. And so I would say one of the most obvious routine use cases for a technology like this is, is simply to test a patient um, that would otherwise require an invasive procedure. Just have a look in the blood at the cell-free DNA and see if you can avoid the, the trouble and the, the relatively low diagnostic yield that that procedure offers and replace it with a, a faster, safer, higher diagnostic yield test that, that uses the cell-free DNA. Yeah, absolutely. And I guess this is extremely important, especially for severe infections. You mentioned pneumonias, but I guess um, cases of sepsis can be also extremely dangerous for patients. And very often that blood cultures return false negative results and the doctors do not have a clue what is actually going on uh, with the patient. So if you could offer your test uh, and diagnose that patient really fast and perhaps even determine what would be the best antibiotic treatment uh, for that patient that, that, that can save a lot of lives. Yeah, you're absolutely right. In fact, the first large-scale clinical study we did was called SepSeq, and we actually looked at how our approach of using the cell-free DNA in blood compared to all diagnostic testing over the course of seven days um, at Stanford's emergency department. And of course, we weren't returning results in real time, but every time a patient was enrolled in that study, we would allow them to go through that uh, standard of care for seven days, and we would draw a carious uh, blood sample and test that. And then when the study was completed, ultimately enrolling 350 patients, we compared the results of our test to, to everything that the blood cultures and the PCRs and the serologies and the invasive procedures, everything added together could find. And, what we found is that blood cultures identified about a third of the infections. Um, all the other molecular uh, testing, such as the PCRs, the invasive procedures, the serology, identified about another third. And carious alone, compared to all of those, added another 30% to the diagnoses on top of what had been established. So it had a 30% higher diagnostic yield than everything else combined. And it's, you know, it's not that surprising. And you think about um, what leads to inefficiencies in standard of care. And one of it is you have to get a sample of the infected tissue or fluid. And in many cases, um, it can be hard to get that sample. And you have to send the right test once you do get that sample. So the bacteria has to grow or it has to be one of the bugs included on a PCR panel, for example. Um, and of course, when you take... Um, cell-free DNA from blood and sequence everything that's known to man, you can avoid both, both of those rate-limiting steps on diagnostic yield. And the really surprising part of that study is we were sure that you would pay in turnaround time. Everybody thinks that sequencing is slow and there's no way to do this um, at uh, clinically relevant time frames. And so we, we just looked at the EMR records from these patients and asked, okay, when was the test that identified the etiology based on blood culture or any of these other microbiological methods, when was that available in the EMR? 
And we compared that to our own measured turnaround times of thousands of samples that we've processed from all across the United States. Our turnaround time from blood draw to um, returning an, uh, a test report to physicians is about 49 hours from the blood draw through the shipping, through our processing, through all of our quality checks and back to the physician is about 49 hours. The, that was faster than the etiological diagnosis for more than 80% of the patients in that study. So this conception that sequencing has to be slow um, or that it isn't going to return results in a clinically relevant time frame is it's just wrong. Um, when, you, when you put your mind to it, like, like we have, and you try to make a test that's as efficient and therefore fast and accurate as possible, you know, we can get to timeframes that are faster than standard of care in that study for 80% of patients. And that's not even counting then, of course, the 30% of patients whose only etiological identification uh, came from the carious test. I think it offers a lot of potential for both sepsis and, and pneumonia and a variety of other diseases. And it's just about finding the right way to balance those strengths with um, the existing tools that are available and the overall economics of testing um, as a society. Yeah, absolutely. These are fantastic results. And if you think about it, your test is more sensitive. It has lower rate of false negatives and uh, it is actually faster than most of the classical tests that have been used so far. So my next question is, what are actually the challenges on the rather organizational side to ensure that your tests are adopted by medical community? Because it is not always easy to convince doctors to switch to a new technology, even if you have a superior solution. So how do you tackle that problem? Fortunately, that's a problem that has been tackled thousands of times as we continue to improve our technology. And the answer is simply clinical evidence that is published in peer-reviewed peer -review journals that describes the difference in results when doctors use our test as part of their suite of tools relative to, to not using our test as a, in their suite of tools. And so... Um, obviously, there are different levels of clinical evidence, different levels of rigor associated to that. And you don't start out with the 10,000 person randomized control trial. Um, you start out on smaller scale. And over the last year and a half or so, we've published 15 peer reviewed evidence, uh, peer reviewed papers describing the, the clinical evidence of how this test compares to standard of care in various patient types. And we're in the midst of doing the tests that look at how our test compares to standard of care um, in patient populations that are in the several hundreds. Um, it's just a, a constant um, generation of clinical evidence of higher and higher uh, rigor that ultimately convinces physicians about the value. And you know, that's the way it should be, um, because a lot of things that look great at small scale can turn out not to be. And um, certainly the peer review process, while not perfect, is the best we have for sorting out the ways that even well-intentioned people can be misled by some of their data. And so you just publish as much of that on the most relevant populations as you can. And of course, the trick is to then find where your test actually meets the greatest need given the existing solution space. And I think I've alluded to some of the places where we think the existing need is, is greater, um, such as you know, the need to, to do these invasive procedures in order to even get a sample to analyze. Um, I think one of the, the very first and most obvious benefits of a liquid biopsy approach is that you can avoid the need for that invasive procedure. And we expect the value to be similar in the, in the same way as non-invasive prenatal testing, for example, avoided the need to do invasive procedures in order to understand fetal health. Perfect. Yeah, that sounds great. As you mentioned, evidence-based medicine is the key. Yep. And you need to show evidence that tests work in large population of patients for specific conditions. And that's what you are doing with great success. And for our audience, we will put the links to some of your most exciting clinical studies into the show notes for this episode. Oh, that'd be great. Yep. 
one more thing that I wanted to discuss with you, uh, also along those economic lines, uh, is um, the importance for diagnostic tests to be reimbursed. Of course, healthcare systems work very differently in different countries, but I want to ask you, do you approach payers in the US and what has been their response so far to, to your tests? Yeah, we're just, um, that's a great question. The, the ultimately, um, you know, we start with what's possible from the technology perspective and you kind of go through this series of, of evidence when you, when you think you've got a test that's actually going to help the world. You know, you start with, does it actually help the world? And then you start asking, does it actually help patients? And we're just now getting into the realm of what does it mean from a monetary standpoint um, for healthcare systems in general? Now, we've been fortunate up to now because, as I said, our test is primarily used on inpatients, which these inpatients are typically reimbursed under the DRG model, where there's a bundled payment based on the disease. And if our test allows the hospital or the institution to um, address that patient's healthcare needs for an overall lower cost, um, then they make a little bit more money from this DRG payment than they would have otherwise. And so, in that sense, we've been operating as more of a business to business model, simply providing a, a faster, more cost effective way to identify the etiology of infectious diseases. As we, of course, think about how we want to bring this technology to a broader cross section of infected um, patients, we do, of course, consider patients that may not need to be hospitalized for their infectious disease. Um, and in that case, reimbursement plays a, a clearly a fundamental role in having it make sense for the healthcare system. And so that I would say up till now, we haven't had to cross that bridge. And right now we're actually in the discussions with various, um, various payers getting, trying to understand what it is that they're looking for and how to demonstrate the health economic value, um, most obviously to them. Perfect. That sounds exciting. And I hope that those negotiations will go well because you bring that great value to the patients and uh, you can also reduce other associated costs of treatment. And so. I guess this is something that should be reflected in the economics of those insurance companies. Yeah, certainly the ability to avoid biopsies seems like um, we know those biopsies cost um, thousands to tens of thousands do of dollars just by themselves, let alone um, whatever length of stay reductions may be possible or, or improved outcomes may be possible. Simply the ability to get to even the same degree of diagnostic yield uh, as an invasive procedure would seem to make health economic sense for payers. And so we think there's a pretty strong value proposition on the economics as well. Perfect. Tim, I would like to conclude with you discussing the future a little bit. Molecular biology, biotechnology are probably the most exciting fields of science today. And there has been so much progress with DNA sequencing, mass spectrometry, and so many other great technologies. So what are your three most anticipated developments in molecular biology or molecular diagnostics? What would you like to see happening, let's say, in the next 10 years? Ah, great question. Um, I think I'll start with the closest to reality. Um, and I would say one thing that I think we could all expect to change, certainly in the next 10 years, is a direct result of this coronavirus pandemic we're experiencing now. The, the main challenges, of course, are with an inability to, to initially detect the, the outbreak and then scale up diagnostic testing fast enough to identify who's sick and who's not. And so um, I don't know how many times in a row this is going to happen before the world takes note, but it certainly feels like um, the economic damage and, and the societal damage associated with this pandemic has certainly outweighed the, the previous SARS or MERS um, epidemics and pandemics that we've experienced. So I would expect the world to change its a perspective on the value of being ready to scale up diagnostics and to deploy them quickly to change quite dramatically after this, simply because we now are aware of how much it costs when we're not ready. And so in that sense, um, I expect uh, diagnostics, which have, you know, kind of from an investor perspective and, you know, I'm on the business side as well, certainly from the, the business side, 
um, been valued in a different category than therapeutics. Uh, you know, I certainly hope that uh, the value of those diagnostics and the ability to scale them rapidly um, gets, um, gets appreciated even more when we see what happens when we're not ready. So that's almost inevitable, I would say. If I, maybe for my second thing, if I were to go a little bit further from what's inevitable, this need and this, this historical, well, I'll say this historical need to obtain a sample of the infected tissue or fluid to grow it up so that there's enough of it to, to do whatever staining and analyses are required. Um, it creates unnecessary bottlenecks. And I think that direct from sample approaches that don't require the time to grow them up and certainly nucleic acid approaches where you're analyzing the most unique thing about every pathogen um, are going to become more and more prominent. I mean, there's simply no reason to rely on physiological or um, enzymatic differences between closely related species when their genomes tell us exactly what differences there are between these species. And it makes sense to go directly to the most unique thing about a bug when you're trying to figure out which, which bug it is. PCR is certainly one of those approaches that's fast and cheap. Uh, traditionally, it has a pretty narrow list of hypotheses that you can test with one, one particular test. Sequencing, I think, is a fundamentally better approach because you can just test for everything that's known to man and you see all the differences from what's already known to man. But it probably won't be until the cost of sequencing and the time it takes to do the actual sequencing come down quite a bit that we see it uh, becoming mainstream like we think of PCR now. And then, um, you know, for, for the third one, I'll just stray a little bit further from what's inevitable and talk about uh, what I hope is possible. Um, and I have reason to believe this is possible based on a study that we just completed with St. Jude's Children's Hospital. So I'll talk about the study and then I'll extrapolate way beyond what the study shows to talk about what I hope it means. Um, so the study was of high risk uh, kids with uh, refractory cancers. And so these kids are at high, high risk of getting infections and actually about 40% of them will die from an infection and not the actual cancer itself. And so this is a population where having great diagnostics for their infectious disease can make a huge difference in their outcomes. We asked whether or not um, we could see the signal that was going to cause an infection before the symptoms of that infection actually showed up. And the rationale was that by the time you feel sick, there's a lot of pathogens multiplying and invading your body. Those pathogens must be contributing cell-free DNA to the blood um, from the very moment they start infecting your body. And so why wait for the symptoms in order to start the testing? And so we just collected samples from leftover other testing every day or two in this high-risk population. And, and when one of these kids got sick, and it was identified through traditional methods, we would go back in time and say how long before the patient actually felt sick enough to get tested could we have identified this, per this kid was going to get an infection. And it turns out that in some cases, even up to seven days beforehand, the, the test would call the infection that uh, this pediatric patient was going to get in seven days. In most, in 75% of the cases, we were able to call the infection three days before the symptoms actually manifest. And so that was a, a great proof of principle that the information about what's going to make us sick is in blood and that the symptoms themselves are actually one of the rate limiting steps for figuring out what's actually going to make us sick. And so if I were to take that observation and just think about what it could mean for us um, when we no longer rely on symptoms to be sick and where we live in a world where sequencing is nearly free and uh, doesn't take so much time to do and is everyone has access, you know, I could imagine a world where it's cost effective enough to just screen people regularly and maybe we don't even have to feel sick um, again to know that we're going to be sick and we can start taking these actions to make ourselves feel better and to fight those infections, you know, without missing those days of work, without 
um, feeling miserable at home and without spreading it to so many people simply because we were infected so long before we knew we were even infected. I think, you know, a lot of things have to go right for that to be a reality, but the principles behind the approach we're taking, the, the popularity of sequencing is growing. Certainly the cost and time it takes to get those sequences are all moving in the right direction such that you know, I don't know if it's going to be within 10 years, but certainly it seems like a lot of the raw materials to make it possible to identify these infections before you even feel sick are all there. And that to me is, um, I certainly don't like feeling sick. I would love to live in a world where um, a really non-invasive part of my life is just a routine screening, simply the same way we take vitamins or do other daily activities, um, allows us to avoid some of these pain and suffering individually, mitigate some of these pandemics, um, there's all sorts of, I think, societal benefits and individual benefits that would happen once we capture the full potential of the information that we know is already circulating in our blood right now today. Yeah, absolutely. That sounds like a very bright future, especially coming back to that last point that you have mentioned. If you can provide that ubiquitous preventive screening then we can truly enable personalized medicine and uh, frankly reduce costs for our healthcare system because less people will get sick in the first place. So let's hope that this will, all of this will happen in the next 10 years. Yeah, um, I'm certainly rooting for it. Tim, before I let you go, I would like you to let our audience know where can they find you online? Oh yeah, of course. So. Um, our company is called Carius, and you can reach us on the web at CariusDX.com. It's K-A-R-I-U-S-D-X.com. And um, if people have questions specifically for me, um, I'm happy to respond via email. It's just my name, Tim.Blaukamp at CariusDX.com. Perfect. Tim, thank you very much for joining us on the podcast. It was amazing to have you here today with us. It was a great pleasure. Thanks for inviting me onto your podcast. Thank you so much for being with us today on the Personalized Medicine Podcast. If you like this show and know someone who would enjoy it too, please share this podcast with them. And don't miss the next episode yourself. Subscribe to the Personalized Medicine Podcast on your favorite podcasting app. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Pocket Casts, Stitcher, iHeartRadio and many, many more. Please rate us there and leave a comment. That helps us to grow and deliver the best experience to you. To access the show notes for this episode, visit our website, pmedcast.com. It's p-m-e-d-c-a-s-t dot com. And engage with us on social media, where we regularly share the news and exciting content on personalized medicine. You can find us on Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook just by typing in Personalized Medicine Podcast or use our handle, pmatcast. And if you have any feedback or would like to suggest a guest for the show, write us an email to team at pmatcast.com. Have a great day and until next time.